Welcome to the Wordy Pair Podcast. Your go-to hub for all things writing, world building, and the occasional dive into the weird and wonderful world of fiction. We're breaking down the barriers between you and your next great story. Whether you're a seasoned scribe or just scribbling your first sentences, We've got something for you. We'll be discussing everything from crafting compelling characters to dissecting the good, the bad, and the downright bizarre in the world of fiction. Okay, this script says you guys are eccentric. Isn't that just a three-syllable word for weird? No offense. So, whether you're in need of inspiration, a good laugh, or just a couple of weirdos to keep you company on your writing journey... You're in the right place. Thanks for tuning in to the Wordy Pair Podcast. All right. Hello and welcome, everybody, to the Wordy Pair Podcast. As always, I'm Rudy. And I'm tired. I'm Justin. I'm also tired, so, you know, what the heck. But, uh... Yeah, today we are going to be talking to you about how to judge your own work and a little bit about editing and stuff like that. At least that's going to be our jumping off point. You know, it's one of those things where you can write something and you can always feel like you can make it a little bit better. And what often happens, at least to me, is that I end up like shuffling things back and forth sometimes. Or it's like, oh, this seems better today. And then three days later, it'll be, oh, this other one, it seems better the way it was. I don't know. Did you ever have that issue? I have that issue a lot. Like, sometimes I go back and read things, and, you know, I, I've been doing it for a long time, so for the most part, I usually have everything in an understandable fashion, but mm-hmm. there are times, like, like I have a few jokes and stories. I go back and read them, and I'm like, oh, those, like, they landed right if you catch that it's a joke, but there's a few, uh, yeah, <laughs> there's a few yeah. where it's like, oh, I didn't really present this to where... Someone knew I was just so you have to like think about it for a bit. And there's times I've done that on purpose, so it gets really hard to distinguish because I go back and I'm like, all right, I know I did this one on purpose. This one did not quite come out the way I wanted it to when I read it. Like I can see where someone wouldn't even know that this was supposed to be a joke. Right. I have an infamous example, and by infamous I mean only I know about it. Uh I made it. It's a about Johnny... as infamous as any of your stories. Yeah. Well well actually <laughs> probably my One of my most infamous was the one that won me that short story contest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there was a there was a joke in that that was a reference to a Johnny Cash song. And when I went back and read it, I was like, nobody is ever going to know that's what I did here. Yeah. Ever. Like, it's obvious to me because I wrote the joke. But (laughs) (laughs) why did why did I put this joke here just to suffer? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it but the I mean, it worked out because it just comes off as a normal line in the story. Especially Mm -hmm. since I was writing it as a a fairy tale, the tone was the same. But it did not come off as the joke I wanted it to. Yeah, but that's okay. Like, some of the, I mean, like, just to be honest, like, jokes, callbacks when they're too obvious are, can be irritating. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, oh, yeah, I see what you did here. And so it's better when the callback is small enough and subtle enough that someone might pick it up and say, oh, that was clever. Um, I wonder if that's what they were trying to go for or not, right? If you leave it in that, if you leave it in that foggy area where it's like, well, I'm not sure whether he was making a callback to this Johnny Cash song or not, it can be a lot more satisfying for the reader. Yeah, but like I said, I think the way I presented this one, it would not. No one's ever going to look at that and realize what I did. Well, what did you do? Uh, I I would have to dig up the story again. Oh, okay. Well. This is how little preparation we do for these. It, oh, I remember <laughs> what it was. It was uh, it was referencing the song John Henry's Hammer, and mm-hmm. it was two characters that were saying, oh, "Well, what what can you do?" And the character says, "Well, I can do anything you want me to do." And that's a line from the Johnny Cash song, but you have to have it to the music really to to know that. And so when I read it, I was like, "Oh, that didn't work. That didn't oh, work I see. at all." <laughs> okay, that's. That that's that might be too subtle to the point where it just yeah. sounds like it's a regular line. Yep, exactly. <laughs> but you'll know, you'll always know. That and that I would line like to think because that was to Johnny Cash. Yeah, I mean that that was like over twenty years ago. So I like to think that okay, so that was like some of my earlier stuff. But it's I've seen it in newer stuff that I've written. I, I tried, like I like writing short stories too, but. 
Yeah. A lot of times when I write the short story, because it's short, you know, I just don't think to edit it quite as much sometimes. Sure, sure. And I can always tell, uh, well, not always, but, you know, sometimes, sometimes you do. Sometimes you knock it out of the park the first time and there's like a spelling error or two that you have to go and fix. Yeah. But there, there have been times where I thought I was good and I wasn't diligent enough. And then I go back and I look at it. I'm like, eh, no, this could have been a lot better. And I I have a bit of a stubborn streak where once I've put something out, it's like, unless it's really, really atrocious, I'm just kind of like, yeah, I'll, I'll let that one hang. Like like that story you brought up. Oh, no, you didn't. I, I don't know if you ever brought that one up on. We, we were talking about it either on a stream or on a podcast at some point. The, yeah, uh, yeah. The oh, team attachments, that story. Oh, that, yeah. Yeah, when I go back and read that, it's like, this is this is really just a string of goofy jokes that I wanted to write after watching an anime, and the story itself kind of works, but it's very, very quick, and it's over very quickly, and I probably tried to put too much into a short, jokey thing. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it, it, could, it could work. There's a place for that, is what I'll say, right? Like, there's definitely a way for that to work out for you. There are people who like short, funny things. I think a lot of people like short, funny things. Well, yeah, but in this particular case, I don't think that there was enough to it that it was... I, I would say it was on the lower end of good for the things that I wrote. And there's always going to be those things, of course. So it's not a Well, problem. like, I'm just thinking of, like, like some Kids in the Hall sketches, right? Like, there's a Kids in the Hall sketch that's just about a guy trying to get his pen. And he, he's just yelling, my pen my pen and chasing another guy and and yells for someone to stop him like, like that that's <laughs> that's an actual thing like like comedy sketches are a real thing so like if you write something that's tightly packed with jokes and funniness even if it doesn't have a particularly engaging plot it might still be something that people want to read okay that that's fair enough but another part of what i was looking at when i went back and read it was i did I did the dialogue without enough between the dialogue to to the point where sometimes it's not entirely clear who's talking to what where. Yeah. So And also some of the characters are named after like random nouns and adjectives, which makes it very hard to tell when someone is talking to someone and not talking about some attachments to something else. Uh yes, that that was um that could have been handled better. <laughs> I, I try to be careful about those things, but sometimes when you're in, in the thick of it and you're just like, I'm on a roll here, you uh, you go through and you don't realize that, oh, there was a there was a bit of a, a bit of confusion in that sentence because of <laughs> no one will understand this but me. <laughs> yeah. No one's getting that Johnny Cash reference. Yeah, like the sentence that's let's go team attachments, attachments shouted. Right. The character's name is the noun attachments. Well, the thing that got me was when they were talking about, like, some engineering problem on the ship they were on. And they're like, oh, someone go get attachments. I'm like, attachments for what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so there were definitely, uh, I mean, I don't know. I had fun writing it, and it reads kind of funny. I think in a place or two it was a little confusing, but. Yeah, I mean, aside from the confusing parts, it's funny enough. It's just that, like, when I was reading it, I was I was visibly consternated at, at certain points. Where I was like, who's to, oh, right. Who's to, oh, right. Who's to, oh, right, he really needs to stop doing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they they all had weird names in this story. Like, one character was named Toots. Yeah. And and to this day, like, I, I wrote it, and yet I'm thinking back, and I cannot remember if she was, I think she was supposed to be Toots, but she might be Toots. I don't know, because it's spelled it, the same it, way. It, it reads as to Toots, yes. Yeah, because I, I think I was making a joke about how... I'm pretty sure it was supposed to be Toots because the character calls her Toots at one point, and the the sort of joke there is supposed to be that he's referring to someone as Toots, which is a way that you refer to a woman, and yet that's actually her name. So he's not actually just what what's the word I'm looking for? He's not just like hey Toots. He he's actually looking referring down on to her. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's he's right. not he's not being patronizing. That's it. There you go. Patronizing is a funny word too, because it means one thing when you're talking to a, talking about a person, and another thing when you're talking about a store. 
Ah, the beauty of words. Yeah, yeah, I think I I, I hit a lot of that kind of confusion in this story. Because <laughs> that's a common joke I'll use. I'll do things like that where it's like the person call, calls her Toots, but then I introduce her in the next paragraph as Toots Fillinger the second. Right, right. Editing a story and judging whether it's... I, I mean... The, the, to me, the best way to judge a sto- to judge a story is to is to get away from it for a day or two, and then come back to it and, and try to read it as if it's just like something that somebody else wrote. And if it's some if it if it makes me chuckle or laugh or makes me say, "Oh, that 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 was a good idea" or "That was interesting," then that's probably like you know it's it's it, it's in the it's in the I can put this up on my blog quality level, right? Yeah. But for like stuff that I'm gonna like put up on Amazon or something, and you know, pretend that someone might possibly pay for it someday, I'm generally going to be a little bit more careful about that stuff. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I I've got I I put up the uh, I got a bit experimental recently when you were talking about putting short stories on Amazon, and I put the Cash mm-hmm. Marley stuff up there, but I I almost instantly regretted it because what I really want to do is compile those into a bunch of short stories to make into a book. Yeah. And now I've put three of the short stories on Amazon. And I, I, I'm wondering if I should unpublish them and just finish the book and put the book up. Or if I should just keep them up and just have them as like... I, I mean, because I don't even have to include them in the book. They're not necessarily important. So one of them I wrote as a Halloween story. Sure. So it's... Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of... There's a lot of things you can think about in terms of that. I don't have the answers for what works and what doesn't or what anyone should do because I think about these things all the time. I'm like, do I want to do it that way? And really, I just want to write books. I want to write pretty much like 40 to 80,000 word style novels. And yeah. it doesn't matter too much to me if I hit like 25,000 or 230,000 on occasion. Yeah. But but I want novel sized novels when I write stuff. I I write a lot of short stories just for kicks. And for, like, the holiday special things that I like to write. Yeah. But I prefer to do whole books and tell a whole story at the end of the day. And so I kind of want to focus on that more. Which is why I was never able to commit to to the sub stack I started. Because I, I started one, I was like, I'm just going to write short stories each week and put them up here. And I kind of crapped out after the first three weeks. It was just like, this isn't what I want to do. <laughs> I see. Well, I mean... Let's not get too far afield into like the marketing area because that's a totally different conversation. But let's oh, let's, yeah, let's yeah. talk so, more about editing and stuff. So yeah, uh, so um, like, do you have a process for editing, or do you just kind of like read over and say, "Oh, I want to change this"? What, what's your what's your mindset when you go into editing a story? I use a bunch of the intuitive techniques. There's uh, th- there's the now there is a technique that a lot of people use where they will read the line out loud, which is a good technique. I I am in no way saying that you shouldn't do that. I have a slightly Although a little time consuming and a little taxing. Yeah, yeah. I I have a slightly different method though. When when I re- when I am going through and wondering if a line is working or not, I will uh, I will imagine several different people's voices in my head reading it and see how each different one sounds to me. Mm-hmm. And that seems to help me get the right voicing for things that I want. And, and, and you know, you accrue these voices in your head. Oh, man, that's a line that should be clipped right there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you accrue these voices Cause, in cause your head. Because the answer is, no, you don't. <laughs> from, <laughs> from watching various media. And, and, and like, it, it just, if I hit a line and I'm like, okay. Out loud, this might not work too well, but let's imagine it in other voices. So I'll, I'll like, sometimes I'll go through like some of my friends' voices. I'll go through various voices from movies and cartoons I watch. And uh, especially when I'm doing like the Cash Marley stories, sometimes I'll even imagine the horror babble guy's voice uh, Mm -hmm. reading some of that. But, you know, it's largely any media I've consumed that I thought there was good voicing for something. I will imagine that voice reading that line. And if I if I imagine several of them and it doesn't work out for any of them, I'm pretty certain I, I need to reword the line. Yeah. I, that's that's a pretty I've been doing it for a long time, so it's it's like my natural method. But it's a pretty complicated method to just up and start using if you're not used to what things are supposed to sound like to make them sound good. Essentially mm-hmm. what you do is you consume enough media that has actual voices to where you know several lines that to you sounded 
incredibly good. And you're like, okay, well, that that line sounded good. You can imagine that line done in other voices and, oh, it still sounds good. Uh, and, and of course, not every line is going to sound good in every voice. But in general, if a line is good and something that, you know, imagine it from the audiobook perspective. Imagine several voices reading your story. There, there's going to be a voice that's going to be best for it to you. But even the ones that aren't necessarily the best, if you imagine it being read in that way, you can kind of get a feel for, all right, so d does this actually sound good when the reader sits down to read it? Because they're yeah. going to be reading it in a voice that you aren't aware of. And so I wouldn't, I, I would say that the easy way to do it is to just read it out loud to yourself to see how hard it reads, you know, how much, how hard it rolls off the tongue for you, how difficult it is for you to read it without like feeling like you're speaking unnaturally uh that yeah, sort of yeah. thing so, th so that's one of the big things that i do when i go back another thing i do i'm looking for sort of this i don't want it to sound too weird to put it like this but there's there's almost like a picturesque quality to how things flow in a paragraph yeah, and, and so I'll I'll look for things like where the pauses are, and if the paragraph sounds awkward because of the placement of certain punctuation, or if there's words that seem to feel repetitive through a paragraph. I, for myself, I'm notorious for using a word at the beginning of a paragraph and then finding out I used the same word to describe something near the end, and when I actually read the whole thing, it's like, oh, that there's there's a sense of redundancy because the word is in there twice and this is yeah, like yeah. usually adjectives and and things it's not words like has or was or the there's going no, to no 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 like it it's it's i mean yeah helping words don't count but like if you keep using the word code over and over again you know to mean like a password or something you might want to you know change it up a bit that thesauruses are are wonderful tools for that and you also have to get a feel for when a word is when there is a word that you can use repeatedly without it sounding redundant. So I'm I'm actually looking at a paragraph here that says pale and dreary. Now, if I were to use dreary three times in this paragraph to describe something, the reader would be like, is the, does this guy speak English? Does he have a grasp of the lexicon? And, <laughs> right, right. But if I were to use pale to like, let's say you have a character that's not named and you're referring to him as the pale man. You could mm -hmm. use the pale man and the pale stranger. Well, yeah, you're using it as a form of dress there. Yeah, yeah you, you you can use things like, you can use it in that way and have it be repetitive without it sounding repetitive because you're indicating who is there taking what action or having what yes. action taken against them. Right. Yeah, I mean, there are times where you need to refer to a character by way of a, a, like a, a th two or three word description of that character. And that's perfectly fine and normal. Like, that's something that, you almost always have to do because it's possible that you'll be writing from the pr pr point of view of a character who doesn't know the name of the person he's talking to or about. So yeah. Whereas, whereas a lot of times like you wouldn't want to see, you wouldn't want to be like the, the rotting ceiling and the rotting floor, the rotting boards that su the support beams for the, for the rotting house. That's... Right. Yeah. With adjectives, it's especially good to switch things up as long as the adjectives aren't being used as the, f as the form of a name, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's also important to, uh, during the editing process is when you want to look for things that need a little touching up like that, because it's just like, uh, I, I always I always say a digital painting, because digital paintings are easier to touch up than an actual painting. Yeah, right. But people still touch up paintings, so just, you know, picture it kind of like, kind of like that you're going through, and you've got, you've got your rotting floorboards and ceilings, and instead it's like, okay, I... I I have this room with the rotting floors and the ceilings that were crumbling to dust, and you know it doesn't have to be one word. You can make expressions that also describe what you want to say is happening to yeah. the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, these are the things I look for the most when I'm editing because my biggest concern, and this isn't going to be everyone's, but my biggest concern is I I want it to I I want it to give a certain image. I don't want it to be I don't want it to feel stale. I've read a lot of especially modern writing where people are just like, they were in a room, the room had chairs, 
Then they went to the next room. And and you don't have to sit there and describe a room that isn't important to the story for six paragraphs. But you you kind of want to give it one good going over when you first introduce someone to a place or you know just it depends on it depends on how important it is one of the tricks that i usually will use is i will have the things that the characters are looking at or are interested in or are interacting with are what they describe and everything else kind of recedes into the background and is you know kind of rough like like there are times where yeah. you know what what you want what you want to know is that these characters that these two characters walked or these three characters walked into an office that there was a desk in the office that there were also two soft chairs in the office. You know, you, so one of the two of the characters sit down in two of the chairs. You know, one of them, the POV character, describes how soft the chair is and how comfortable it is, and why it's especially comfortable for him for right now because he just got off of this very hard job kind of thing. You know, you describe a couple of things on the walls that are re- that are relevant to you know one of the characters. Oh yeah, these are awards that this character you know won for conduct above and beyond the the Call of Duty kind of thing. You know, you describe, oh yeah, you know, we expected this guy to go back behind his desk and sit at his chair. But what he actually did was he went and he leaned and kind of sat on the edge of his desk, you know, kind of perched on the edge of his desk. You, you get a nice picture that way. Yeah, you you kind of have to be the meme of that guy holding the cigarette and pointing at the cork board with all the red lines running everywhere. Uh, you, yeah. You, you, you might benefit from getting really good at explaining the the types of imagery and characters and the things that are going on without directly addressing them. So like, you know, you have a desk that's not important to the story, but you have a character walk into a room and maybe, maybe you don't point out that there's a desk there. Uh, You have, you have the character, let's say it's first person. The character says, I I looked over to the desk in the corner. He says the desk instead of there was a desk in the corner and I looked over to it. Right. We can assume that if if someone's walking into a room, it could possibly be an office, and therefore there would be a desk in this office. And so the person can look there, and on the desk are things that he notices that give him an idea of what kind of person sits there. And so you're bouncing from like the character development to description of a room to placement of objects on a desk, and all of it paints a picture that... Uh, it's going to be interpreted in each reader's head differently, but it is painting a picture. Vagary is your friend here. It's like kind of like playing a video game as you when you're far away from something and things haven't even clipped into the image yet. And then yeah. as you move forward, you, you get like this outline of mountains and then you move even closer and you get like a clearer outline and there's snow on the top and you start to see trees. And then when you're right there, it's just like, You're looking at the bark of a tree on the side of a mountain and you're so close to it, you can't even tell that you're on a mountain, but you can, you can describe, uh, fine details. And that's the important thing. Like what you're focused on is what needs the fine detail and everything else. You just kind of have to give a vague notion to the readers so they, they have some idea that you're not just standing in a black void. Yeah. Yeah. And I do, uh, that, that is getting back to the whole editing and judging your work. I do sometimes when I'm, I mean, all the time when I'm going through my rough draft, it's like, Ooh, this is just an empty black space here that the characters are in. I should do something with this. Yeah. Or even like this character is too bland. I need to, I just need to add one or two details that make, and that, that's another trick. I, I don't say trick. Like it's not really so much a trick as this is one way that you might want to do it. If you have a character and you're reading through a story, it's like, I didn't do a good job with this character. This character's really bland. I wanted this character to matter more and I wanted it to feel more, you know, realistic or whatever. Right, right. You you want to go through and say, okay, where can I add just a few little details that make this character feel more alive when you read yeah, it? Yeah. You, you don't have to rewrite everything to do this. You don't even have to write a lot to do this. There could be one point in the story that makes all the difference where you add a bit of context to this one part of a story and that sits in the reader's mind as the rest of it plays out. So they know what kind of character that is. So yeah. the actions that they take now make a different kind of sense than if you didn't have this little additional detail about this character. Right. Right. I kind of think of this as like an S curve. You, you start somewhere and you have an ending already, but what you do is you increase the amount of stuff in between those two points in order to add some detail to 
either flesh something out or to add a nuance that you, you that you want to be there. And you still get from point A to point B, but now you have a little bit longer of a path in between them. Uh, yes, that gives you a little bit more detail, basically. Right. Increase the amplitude, but maybe not try to turn it into a sawtooth. Right. <laughs> So, so what what else can we say about judging your own writing? Well, like what I'll say is that, like, if you're proofreading or, or, or editing a very long work, it might not be practical to read the whole thing out, right? Right. You know, it it, it could be that it could be that you know it's a hundred thousand words, and your throat will pass out long before you get to the end of that work, and it, you know even for the portion of it that you want to edit today, so to speak, right? Say you were planning on editing over the course editing it over the course of a week. Well, you probably aren't going to want to read fourteen thousand words in uh, in a day out loud. But what you but but what's really important is to actually slow down, especially if it's a, if it's your own work, right? When you read your own work, you have a tendency to skip through it because you know it very well because you're the one who wrote it, obviously. But yeah. uh, there there are two things that you can do to help you avoid the mistakes that can be made by doing the, that skipping because a lot of mistakes can kind of worm their way in that way uh, mis- mistaken word choices sm- minor typos even small like plot inconsistencies but if you slow way down and and you know like you said you don't have to read it out loud necessarily but you should be hearing it in your head and it should be at a a, ra- a reasonably slow spoken pace in your head uh you can go through and you can make sure that you actually look at every single word and make sure that it's the right one and not like you know the wrong there so to speak you know, this is one of those things that that you can find a lot of mistakes this way is simply by slowing way down. Because when when it's your own work, you're gonna have a tendency to skip things, and you can have like double thes and things like that. But if you pr- if you treat it like it's someone else's work, uh, and really really slow down and pretend you don't know anything about it, then you'll end up finding a little bit more detail out of it, and that can be helpful. I, you know, yeah, and going and over I- things multiple times helps too as well. Um, so well, yeah, you you kind of want to be your own harshest critic, yeah, in, in a lot of ways because it's it's your own work that you're representing. So you want you, you want the harshest eye looking over it in order to get the best product out of it. Right. Uh, another thing that you know you you mentioned slowing down, but there's also uh, you can you can do a read through of it normally, and he, Rudy is right. You do not want to read every single line out loud. What you do is you look for speed bumps. As you're reading, if you hit a point where it's like this this sentence or this paragraph or this you know, this line following this line, it feels a little off. You have to look for those mm-hmm. speed yeah. bumps. And that's that's definitely a place you do want to slow down and you want to say, okay, what's going on here that I don't quite feel is right? Why don't yeah, I why feel it's right? Wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what can I do about it to make it better if I even need to? Because while you do want to be your harshest critic, you might not necessarily be wrong with the thing with the thing that feels like a speed bump. You you might look at it a few times and say, actually, it works really well, and uh, it or at it, least works decently well. Yeah, it, it it can. I mean, generally speaking, if you find a speed bump in your story, like a sentence or a paragraph that just seems like it doesn't flow properly, generally speaking, it's better to go and try to figure out a way to make it work in a way that seems to flow well. You know, sometimes that's a sometimes that's very hard to do. Sometimes there's like some weird situation that you're describing that just there's just one too many commas in the sentence, and I'm not sure how to get it out of there, kind of thing. You know, that kind of thing does happen, but the 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 goal is to identify them and see if you can, because what 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 you can often do is you can often move a part of that paragraph or a part of that sentence to a different part of the let's say that page, and you can find a, a better place to kind of nestle it in. You can you can improve the flow that way by taking the by taking the the jagged part and putting it somewhere where it fits in. Yeah, and these while this is all good advice, it's also important to remember not to overthink it too much. I mean, if you have something that's a solid paragraph that that might feel a little off, but it's not really a bad paragraph, you might not have to do anything with it because the reader is going to read through. They're not going to notice all the things that you notice. Once a reader is done reading a story, it's a collection of images in their head that they themselves have put together. And that is largely what's going to determine their perception of it. As long as everything is 
well written. It's it's not like a train wreck of forgotten punctuation, uh, words mixed up, double words that shouldn't be there. Had hads are okay. I don't care what anyone says. Well, I mean, if you can minimize them, it usually yeah, helps. Yeah, you don't want to use them everywhere. But I mean, if you if you have, but, but them, there are places where where you are describing something where someone was doing something continuously in the past, yes. and that's just you know, there's just not a way around that sometimes. Yeah, because I had had too much to eat today, but it, it. I mean, this, and you have to remember, people are going to read it in their head in the way that they they are you know someone they imagine saying it would say it. So everyone's heard someone say, "I had had." At some mm-hmm. point, there, there's it's it's not uncommon. It's it's maybe not the most common phrase, but people say that all the time. When people are talking to each other, they don't talk in the most eloquent of speech all the time. No matter how good they are at speaking, they will have their own personal gaffes where where they're like, "Oh, I didn't end that sentence properly" or whatever. But you know, you're not being overly conscious about it. It's just normal conversation. That's why podcasting works so well. I mean, I don't really talk so much as uh, the same way as I write. That's a certainty. Yeah. So, well, it's it's one of those things where there you you'll generally take a lot of shortcuts when you're actually speaking that you don't want to necessarily take when you're writing because right. it makes your writing sound like it's written in like um what's the word like dialect. Yeah, yeah, and you don't want your writing to look like unpunctuated, uncapitalized Twitter jargon either. I mean, you know. The th- the thing about it is that the ear is a lot more forgiving than the eye. Yeah. And so, you know, a, a, a person when reading it will notice that you didn't capitalize this proper noun and will notice that you put like way too many commas in the sentence and notice that maybe, you know, this hyphen doesn't belong here kind of thing. Um, way more than b- because because you can go back and you can reread a line if it bugs you. And you, but you can't generally be like, can you repeat that exactly the way you said it just a second ago to someone? So just just by nature of habit, your ear is going to be a lot more forgiving than your eye because you can't, you know, replay all audio back, you know, afterwards if something strikes it as a little bit odd. You have to, you have to use implication and uh, and intuition to figure out what someone was trying to say if they're being unclear. And usually it's pretty easy, but like. When you're reading it, it can start to really annoy after after a little while. Yeah, and, and the reason it happens like that sometimes, like, like like the reason I say that sometimes you'll hit those speed bumps, your brain is already ahead of you on where the sentence is going when you start to read it. Yeah. But if if your brain is ahead of you as you're reading, and you're constantly finding that you're you're hitting a point where your brain is saying, wait, 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 that wasn't what I was expected. What happened here? And that that's kind of like causing that speed bump in your head because it doesn't, that's usually an indication that something doesn't read very naturally. Yeah. As opposed to the way that you may have learned to interpret sentences. Yeah. You know, and well, we'll, you don't, and you we're don't talking at write the poetry, but, but there is something that is very compelling about a well-written, well-flowing sentence. Yeah. Yeah, and there is something to be said for the individual sounds of letters and words and how they flow into the next word. Yeah. So so there there's a slight bit of artistry to it. It's writing is mostly technical in that sense, but it's technical in the way that you you have a very you have a you have I mean in English you have 26 characters and a bunch of punctuation and then you have a few right. few different ways to present such such as different fonts different sizes and different methods of bolding and italicizing all that fun stuff all yeah. of those things will present an image as the person is reading that is it, it's amplifying the meaning of the words on the page in front of them uh you know if you go back far enough to where people were were not italicizing much of anything which i i mean i think people have been italicizing things for for a long long time in writing well i mean people people would italicize things back before there was typeface back yeah. when they were writing things by hand sometimes so yeah, yeah it's I, been a thing for a long time and and it's it has this effect where even someone who has never really like try to think back like when did you first realize what italics were doing you were, you know, you're reading through a book and you just see this slightly slanted font and probably, I mean, if you're anything like me, the first time you read it, you just, 
you passed over it and you're just like, okay, well, that must mean that it's emphasizing something or it's it's like making it stick out to me. You don't have to think yeah. about that. Your your brain figures that out for you. And sure. and and so maybe there's a maybe there's people that actually look up what it means. I don't know, but one book with various uses of a of italics is enough to for you to understand what's going on there. And even one sentence really it is a pretty good indicator. Boldface, maybe that's a little trickier. Like, oh, did they accidentally type over this twice? You know, back in the olden days. Yeah. When people were writing with typewriters. I I I think that really it's not so much about trying to have a perfect sentence and paragraph and grammatical structure every time. It's about did I create something that I can sit down, look at, and read through, and my brain isn't saying, wait a minute, this is very confusing. What is going on here? Yeah. These words don't, uh, these aren't words that I would normally put together, and therefore it makes it harder to read. Sure, sure. It, you know, there's, it, and it, this isn't to say that there's certain combinations of words that you absolutely don't want to use. The trick is that you have to kind of give in to how your brain wants the structure of the sentence to come out where you have a noun and it's given an adjective and the adjective makes a bit of sense for the noun. It it doesn't necessarily have to be a noun and an adjective that, you know, they when you look at them, they flow well together from a pictorial side where, where like maybe it ends in a hard K and then starts with a, then the noun that it's describing starts in a D. It's easier to interpret that when you're reading as opposed to speaking out loud sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, th this is kind of, I'm, I'm circling around to this whole speaking your lines out loud thing. You will find word combinations where it doesn't sound good out loud, but if you're just reading it, it sounds great and you don't necessarily want to change it. You just want to avoid doing that so much that, like, let's say if your plans are to do an audiobook in the future, you don't want to have to recite word combinations that are tricky for the tongue every other sentence. Yeah, yeah. And there's another aspect. Unless you, unless you want to torture your narrator. Uh, yeah, yeah. The uh, the narrator will not forgive you for that. But uh, again, right. this is one of those things where you're looking for, like, something that is really, really off in this scenario. You're not looking yeah. for things that... It, it bugs me a little, but it's doable. Because that might just be your own personal hang-up. Sure. If it's really something that's like, it just doesn't feel right speaking these two words together like this. It doesn't flow well. Even in my head, it doesn't. You know, you know, all of that stuff is what you want to look for. When it's really a problem, that's when you kind of focus on that and say, okay, I'm going to fix this. Because there's the reverse of that. Now, this is actually not so much to do with writing. It's something I noticed when I was studying Japanese was that I would imagine the words being said in my head and I would have these combina combinations in my head where since I'm not used to speaking Japanese, it was hard to imagine how someone would say it in my head if I hadn't heard it. And so sure. I would get these combinations of words. It's like, that seems really tricky. Then I would try saying it out loud two or three times. It's like, oh no, that actually does work. So sometimes the words in your head uh, feeling off is the part that's wrong. I know I'm throwing a wrench in here after all the other advice we gave, but it's just it, you you're going to pick this up as you try to edit your own stuff. Well, I mean, what what do you mean exactly? Like go over this a little bit more carefully because I'm I'm a little, I'm not quite following you. So, you have a combination of say a Japanese word that ends on the hard n and mm -hmm. the next word starts with a rolling r. Mm -hmm. Now, now this is a bit of a tricky one for people that don't understand the various ways that you can use the hard N. Yeah. And if you if you haven't heard enough people say it and you're trying to imagine it in your head, it, you know, you're going off of what you know based on English speaking. And so it yeah, sounds yeah. It, it sounds tricky to you. And you're like running various voices and things over in your head trying to say it. And it's like, it just doesn't seem right. I need to hear an example. But then you actually try saying it out loud. And, you know, assuming that you know the tricks to how the uh the n can sound depending on the consonant that comes after it yeah you you try saying it the various different ways and you you sometimes find that oh well there's actually a level where you don't want to say it quite as hard or you want to or maybe you want to say it harder to get it to flow into the next sound 
And that's something mm -hmm. that you weren't able to figure out just in your head because your inner voice didn't have that experience, but you're we're saying it saying it orally, you're able to try different things that give you that ability to say, oh, okay, that's how maybe it's supposed to sound a little better. I see, I see. There, there's a lot of strange techniques that I've used to examine my own writing that are along those lines. And, you know, learning another language is actually a just anything you learn that teaches you a new trick it can come in handy in the weirdest places sometimes. And I have found mm -hmm. that writing is one of those places where there is so much that uh, almost any subject that you learn something uh, or you, or you learn a fancy trick about how to do something with words or, you know, how certain books read. And, and of course, any subject you're reading is just more material for your knowledge, for things that you can put into a story. R writing is right. one of those like funnels for all the knowledge you have, you can apply to this one particular craft. Interesting. I mean, for me, part of the structure of my editing process is to split up, to, to, to have a focus every time I go through. So like, you know, my first run through, it'll be mostly like proofreading and looking for awkward sentences. The second time I'll start looking for places to add details about like the setting. You know, maybe the third time I'll, I'll focus on the dialogue. Maybe the fourth time I'll, I'll focus on uh, like any plot inconsistencies, looking for those. I find that it helps to have a focus when you re when you have a focus in mind when you reread your own work for editing purposes because it helps you be especially aware of particular issues that you're trying to deal with. You know, going through something multiple times also helps you find be, be more likely to find the little things too. You know, every time you go through you'll find another, you know, two or three of the little mini typos that don't mean much to you and don't mean much to the story but might mean something to the reader. I don't know. I, I used to, you know, I read a bunch of, I read a lot of books and, and a lot of the professionally edited books have, you know, I, I do see books that have zero typos in them. And so I don't know why, but my eye catches typos very, very uh, uh, intensely. And they, they do kind of mess up, mess, mess with my immersion in the story. And it, it feels like those typos should be dealable, you know, but it's a question of how many times are you willing to go over and look things over again, especially because like, um, if you're adding a lot to the story, you're adding more things that might have typos in them. So, you know, you always need to go over it kind of that last one with just the focus on typos to make sure that you're not making any stupid mistakes. Yeah. That, that was, uh, that was a point I was going to make. If you didn't, the last, yeah. the last thing I do is I go through and I mean that might be three different read throughs just just looking for typos if if I have to because I mean while I won't say that my immersion is necessarily broken for typos I will say that typos do jump out to readers they yeah. they might not jump out to the person who wrote it who's going through an editing which is why you want to be harsher with your own editing than you would imagine an editor would yeah but you you will you will be noticed if you have a single typo so you know chances are i'd say 90% of people that are reading whatever you wrote are going to see that typo it'll it'll just the brain will notice it for them and they will you know they might not even stop but they'll be like oh that was a typo and yeah it's it may not matter that much in the long run but you do want to reduce it as much as possible i mean i I think I still have two or three typos for as much as I went over the good guy. Mm -hmm. I, I think there are still two or three typos in there. And I, I fixed several of them after publishing, which uh, annoyed me thoroughly because I was like, how did I have so I, I think it was 36 after publishing was how many problems wow. I found. And I was like, how did I miss all yeah. this? You know, I had one character that was, uh, it, it was... I was referring to a she, and the word was supposed to be the. <laughs> uh-huh, yeah, right. No, I mean, that, that kind of stuff happens pretty easily. Uh, you know, it's very easy for that to just kind of work its way into a into a big work, especially especially the longer the work is, the harder it is to read it, you know, a large number of times for editing purposes. You really kind of want to try to minimize that number if you can when you're dealing with a 200,000-plus word story. Oh, if it's if it's broken up into chapters, I would recommend doing it chapter by chapter. I I well yeah, of course, but like it it's still a daunting task to go through 
you know, X, X words when X is a very large number, regardless of how it's split up. Yeah. And I wouldn't have a panic attack if you discover after publishing that you've got two or three, you know, typos in a book. Well, so, that's, I mean, that's not going I'm to be I'm reader. seeing, I mean, it depends, it depends a little bit, but like, well, it I'm depends on how bad the typo is, but. <laughs> well, that's true too, but no, but I I see a lot of books in indie publishing that have a decent number of typos and that seems to be like a thing these days is that it's just like, ah, we don't care that much about that. Yeah. I think we went over and, my you know, theory on that before, didn't we? Maybe. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, just, I, I just can't like, really remember it. People got used to how people wrote. On oh the yeah, internet. we did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah, it's kind of a, it's kind of a downer for someone like me that really enjoys reading a book without seeing mistakes jump out at me. You know, it's just kind of the way things are. And the cool thing about, you know, indie publishing is that, you know, if you feel like you found a mistake, then you can always fix it if you want. I mean, generally speaking, it's it's considered bad form to make major plot adjustments after the story has been published. But Oh yeah, don't uh, you don't want to do that. Don't don't do that. But like if you find a if you're reading it and you find a couple of typos, you can always reversion it and say, Oh yeah, I fixed two typos. Yeah, that's uh that's not a huge problem i'm I'm trying to remember what the final typos were because i'm pretty sure i i never fixed the last ones because i had fixed it so many times by that point Uh uh uh-huh but yeah it's it's you you really shouldn't let it haunt you if you've got like two or three typos that are insignificant after you've published that's not a big deal definitely definitely put a lot of effort into catching those typos though because 36 was way too many i have been doing this way too long to let 36 typos slip by me. I don't know what yeah. happened there. I mean, it's the longest thing I ever wrote, fair enough, but still 36 typos. It, is quite large, yes. You know, I, I, and, you know, it, what happens, of course, is you put the book out there, then it's like, alright, now that it's out there, instead of reading it on my computer where I wrote it, I'm going to read it in book form, or ebook form, and as the case may be. And I'm reading through, right. and I'm reading through, I'm like, typo. Typo reading through typo and then my brain starts to do that then my eye starts twitching and <laughs> i'm like wait a minute i have this many problems yeah i mean you know sometimes th- there are cases where typos get into books back in the old days through like transcription errors and things like that like um you know one of my main complaints of the the paperback nero wolf books is that they aren't they weren't very well put together compared to the originals like you can find a lot of typos in the paperbacks, and they're just not there in the originals. Yeah, I remember reading an interview with Terry Pratchett one day, where someone had asked him about a typo they found in his book, and he's like, "I have the original manuscript. That typo isn't there. I don't know how it got there in the books." Yeah, I mean, editors are fallible too. Yeah, I, I and mean, so we're like, you know, I mean, if, if something's getting printed in like movable type, you know what I mean? Like, not 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 like full digital, you know. If there's a if there's a transition from paper to digital and then back to paper, it, mistakes can show up there too. Like, um, I mean, you'll find this a lot in books that have been like a PDF made from a scan, where like th- there will be a P that gets transcribed to an H or something like that. Oh yeah, something that happens. So, like like an OCR scan. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Um. You know. And so, like, it's always helpful to have access to a scan of an earlier edition if you can find one or you know having an earlier edition if you can find one so that you can be like was this in the original or not oh it's not in the original so you know this has been this this is clearly a mistake from the either the scan or the the work of the person who did the scan basically yeah there, there's always a there's always this small part of me that like a lot of people have been using ai to check their work you know, basically an yeah. AI to be their editor. And there's al- yeah. there's always this Luddite part of me that's just like, yeah, that's exactly what I need. My book is finished and all of the editing is perfect, except somewhere in the middle of the story, the machine just decided to write vagina five times. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's how AI is going to get us. It's just going it, to, it's just going to screw with us. It's <laughs> mm-hmm. When, Until we all pull our hair out. When artificial intelligence eventually becomes sentient, that's that's what it's going to do to humanity. It's just going to minorly inconvenience uh, con- inconvenience us uh, to extinction. I mean, that's better than some story. That's that's a better idea than uh, than some stories. Yeah, <laughs> I, 
Are you referencing my story? <laughs> yeah. No. Oh. No, I'm. I'm just thinking that, like, you know, that that actually be a funny way to 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 set that up. Oh, like having but, having um, the Muttley of sentient, intelligent machines. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> like it's just it's just a, it, you know, all you know, all of this massive computing power, all of this massive ability to like improve itself, and what it does is it chooses to screw with people. That, that sounds about right. Yes, it redesigns all of our shoes, so it makes it hard for us to keep our balance, but but only just. To the point where only left shoes. Well, well, no, only to the point where where we think it's us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, multiple redrafts is another thing that people seem to be like hesitant to do these days. Like it's like, yeah, I went over it once, and that seems good enough, kind of thing. But like, realistically, if you're writing a story long enough for it to actually like be published or self published, you probably should be trying to actually improve the the story a little bit from your first thoughts, right? Like yeah. there, there you, you might find places to put additional um, little bits of plot or character development and doing one basic redraft or two basic redrafts where you're just kind of looking for typos won't get you the improvement to the flow and the, and the completeness and the immersiveness of the story that like a, a few extra proper redrafts looking particularly at plot and character will do. That's why I, you know, like I said earlier, it's good to have a focus for your, redrafts but it's also good to try to think of as many different focuses for your redrafts as possible because just saying i'm looking for 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 typos now i'm looking for typos again now i'm looking for typos again gets very boring and it can be a lot more engaging to be like okay this time through yes if i find any typos i'm going to fix them but what i want to look for is i want to look for any places where i see something that is mentioned but not described well and i'm going to fill those out um, you know, when, when applicable, like if it's just like a, a, a chair, then I'm not going to worry too much about it. But like, if someone mentions, you know, like an alien being and they just say, oh yeah, he was green. Uh, we're going to, we're going to fix that. And you can do that with plot too. You can, number one, you can look for plot inconsistencies, which is a, a big one that you got to go really f- slow for because you have to actually remember everything that kind of refers to a given point in the story as well. Um, I just found uh, a plot inconsistency. Uh, while I was editing my novel, and I was like, "Oh, I just okay, that's that's not right. I need to fix that." I think I mentioned somewhere that there was like two gas giants in a system in at one point, and then like I said, there was only one. Um, and it's like, "Oh, I, I better better fix that because that is inconsistent. It's a small inconsistency, but people will notice." Yes, uh... um, and, and and it's it's one of those things where it's like, "Where did this other planet come from?" Right. Right. No, no, that's and that can be very jarring too. Yeah, well, I mean, we had a whole discussion on that fight scene in, uh, uh, what was it, the uh, the, Bra- the Brandon Sanderson book, uh, just based yeah. on how hard it was for us to keep count of w- how many people were there in that scene. Well, for me, it was one of those things where, like, he said eight, I'm looking for eight, I don't find eight. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean I've mentioned my, my favorite plot inconsistency. I, I had that... Uh, you know, I got the character that can't talk, and and throughout the whole book yeah. she can't talk. And then as I was doing the, I think it was the first uh, run through, yeah. the first run through of editing, I found that I had given her one line of dialogue in the middle of the story, and I was like, wait, how, how did I? <laughs> wait, wait, what? <laughs> Why is she talking here? She can't talk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, that's a good catch because that would have been th- th- that would have been pretty been plot very... inconsistent. <laughs> Well, like, the thing about it is that it would have, like, some people probably would have seen it as avant-garde. Like, ooh, the, you know, one line for this mute character in the middle of the story. Like, it's a like it's a hidden treasure for the reader. Yeah, no, I don't do that, no. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, oh, I agree, but, like, yeah. Good point. Good point. You you brought up the, uh, the adding of detail. So, yes. you do not have to be good at everything. The, the example I'll give is, uh, so, so... I myself prefer to flesh out the characters more than the scenery in my stories. I feel like mm-hmm. I'm much better at it. And so I'll describe scenery, but I will not be that person who gets into great detail about, uh, you know, how how wonderful things look to the characters or how dismal or, or whatever, you know, what, you know, they're in a setting. I'll, I'll give a brief description of the setting to say, okay, so here's, here's what your imagination needs to go off of in order to understand sure. where these characters are and what they're experiencing. 
I'll say that there's this building or that building and it's, you know, I'll, I'll give, uh, I'll, I'll try to give conjure an image of a style of the building, maybe add a bit of color here and there, but I am not hyper focused on making it detailed to the point that, you know, someone could look at it and say, okay, I'm going to draw a picture of what I think the author is describing here. And, and it, it just wouldn't come anywhere close probably. Right. Whereas there are people that can give such good descriptions of scenes and settings that someone could try drawing it and they could probably bring it to them and be like, oh yeah, that's actually a lot like what I had in my head. So, so like you still want to describe things. You still want people to not just have a, an image of a black void where everyone is standing around, but you don't have to be the best at everything. I, I think. Sure. Sure. So, so I see a lot of people that, they they ask for advice on writing fight scenes or they'll say fight, writing you know action scenes is really hard that's actually like my specialty i I've, I've been doing that more than just about anything and i feel i'm really good at that and i have a lot of fun developing new characters but as far as describing scenery and things i'm i don't put top effort into that because i know at the end of the day that's it's one of the things that i'm less interested in and so yeah. i I will not be as good at that at that and trying to do a perfect job at that. Trying to be the best at everything is just going to probably ruin the setting, actually. It's probably better for me to write the way I write. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The the other thing that I do is I actually keep track of how much I've added or subtracted from a from each chapter as I finish editing it. And what I've noticed is that like the first run first couple of run throughs, I'm I'm in, I'm adding five, ten percent to each chapter as I go through. And then as I get to the point where I'm kind of satisfied with things, that number starts to go toward, it starts to get small, down to like, you know, half a percent or one percent kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, you have an insane amount of detail in, in your stuff. You, you've you really got, ev- like, everything that's important has its place with a lot of your uh, descriptions of settings and so forth. Well, it's one of those things that I try to pay... Especially when I'm trying to do like a hard science fiction kind of aspect to something, I have to pay attention to the details and make sure that they're not that the, that they're right number one, and that they're also like clearly enough explained that a person without a scientific background can understand them. Yeah, this is one of those things where like I, I mentioned this earlier, but like hard science fiction uses scientific principles to to explain how the setting interacts with other parts of the setting or how the setting changes over time. But if you demand that someone, you know, solve Bernoulli's equation, that's not that, that's not hard science. That's just a that's edutainment and bad edutainment at that. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, why did you pick that specific example? <laughs> well, because didn't didn't we didn't we look at something where uh, there was a few weeks ago that we looked at like a meme or something about someone who was like putting. Or, or maybe this was just me, but like I saw someone write a like a meme somewhere where like, like it was it was it was a parody, but at the same time it was like, well you know, you, you see this this is uh, this is the this is the Laplacian of uh, of this equation here on the cover. That means this is hard science fiction because it has equations. It's like <laughs> that's not please don't please don't do that. Yeah, I. There is. It's sad that all forms it's, of it's science like, um, fiction have it's suffered. It's like that. It's like that. It's like the part of the Simpsons where the, where the where the where they have the, uh, the what was it? It was it was like a a dog on a leash or something, and, and like, no no, it, it, they put a leash on a kid, and the kid says this leash demeans us both, right? <laughs> it's it's like that. Like this 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 equation demeans us both. Yeah. It, God, what does it remind me of? It. It, it it almost it, it kind of makes me it, i imagine that scene in the story about aliens that were pretending to be altruists for humanity but really the book was a cookbook yeah at the end of at the end of the twilight zone version the, where the woman's like it's a cookbook i just uh, picture her like lunging forward and and shouting it's not hard sci-fi and then the guy starts screaming <laughs> as they load him onto the ship <laughs> <laughs> i like that that's very good yeah i might have to redub that <laughs> or do a skit or something yeah well, well the simpsons did the best skit of that because they they basically did the entire thing just to just to crap on Lisa Simpson, which always makes for a good Simpson story. Right, right. 
God, how many times did they blow the dust off the like nobody thought to wipe the dust off the cover of that book that whole time that's the best part yeah <laughs> look there is more dust <laughs> <laughs> and then everyone was angry at Lisa <laughs> right oh boy a lot of Simpsons jokes today there was there were two three right now two two in this podcast there were three altogether oh that's fair they don't know the the people who are listening to this don't know about that. Yeah, we don't talk about but that's that. That's to their that's to their detriment. Yeah, N- nothing outside the uh, nothing outside the wordy pair. Nothing. What what's how does the quick nothing against nothing the against wordy the wordy pair. Wordy pair nothing. nothing outside the wordy pair. <laughs> right. So I mean I think that's kind of the main takeaway is especially when editing your own stuff, go slow, multiple redrafts. Focus on each different redraft for something sp- specific, and also like um, as for judging your own work, like when you read your own stuff, you 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 probably have a bit of a a bit of a bias, like a positive positive bias toward it usually. But like, what you can do is if you're gonna redraft multiple times, you can feel you can you can measure the the difference in that in that reaction over time, like. My first draft of my novel, I was like, eh, it's okay, but, you know, there were a few places where I kind of was bored and phoned it in here a little bit. But right now, at this point, and, you know, the the dialogue is a little bit mess in some places, but at this point, actually, I'm actually finding some pretty good, like, ooh, this is cool, or like, ooh, this is a funny line, or stuff like that. And so, like, once you get to the point where your own work is significantly better than its original draft, and you also are like, yeah, I like this. I like reading this. At that point, it might be worth, it might be ready for publication um, kind of thing. Like, like, you don't want to polish forever because then you'll just never publish anything. But uh, you also don't want to polish very little. Yeah. But if you pay attention to, like, how much you're adding per redraft, if you pay attention to how much better you think the story is after every redraft, if you feel like, if you like, you know, the cool thing about editing your own stories is you can be like, wait a minute, there'd be a really good place for a subplot right here. And you can just stop and you can just add a subplot and go over it a couple times and be like, okay, this one it looks similarly well polished to the rest of the book now. Now I'm going to go into a full redraft and see how it fits. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work that can be done in editing. You can endlessly polish, but you can actually improve things quite a bit depending on how inspired you were with your first draft. It's also true that like you can't necessarily tell how other people are going to view your work. Like you had that, you had that Button Man story, right? Right. That you kind of like just like vomited onto a page almost, yep. and you're like, man, I I didn't even bother editing this, and it's like got like it got the most a- a- applause of any of the other stuff you'd written for Iron Age. No, 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 no. That was the Button Man. No, not the Button Man. Uh, the Bag Man. The Bag Man was the oh. one that people liked. That that one was edited. I I did I did edit the Button Man. Or the the bagmen uh, extensively. No, but you you said you said that the button man got some pretty good results too. Uh, yeah, no, I was that one. It wasn't people didn't really like that one as much as the bagmen. What happened was I was surprised at how many people did enjoy it, as opposed yeah. to other things I had written. A lot more people were interested in that than some of the ones I thought were much better. And it, I yeah. mean, when I go back and read it, I still kind of feel like eh, I didn't do the best job with this. It's kind of it's got its moments here and there, but I could have fleshed it out a bit more. That that was the biggest thing about it was I felt it wasn't fleshed out enough. Sure, that's fair. But, you know, sometimes you have a deadline. <laughs> Did I have a deadline? Well, yeah, there's a deadline for those things to get posted. Yeah, I think I was well within that deadline. I don't I don't remember when I... I don't know. Yeah. But, I mean, th- 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 this is not just you. This is other people, too. Sometimes you have... A, sometimes other people have deadlines, too. Yeah. And so, like, you know, if you have a deadline, obviously you have to stop editing by then. But, like, you have to understand that editing, the editing process might take as long as the writing process did in the first place. So, yeah, that's, you know, jumping back just a little bit, that is a pretty good indicator that you've got something that that someone else somewhere is going to be able to enjoy. If you're working Mm -hmm. on your story and you get to a point where it's like, I enjoy reading the thing that I wrote. Even with your personal bias, if you're, I mean, I've, I've reread the good guy, like, you know, 12 times now. I, mm-hmm. I love that story. And I know that's biased of me to be like, yes, 
It's great. Can't get enough of it. But if you've got something that you can read and enjoy that many times, chances are someone else somewhere will also enjoy it quite a bit. And if only you could find them. Yeah, well, look, my, the cross-section for people that would like that book is that of people who enjoy watching Dragon Ball Z and also reading books. And let me tell you, that is a very small niche. I, I mean, I agree with you. But, like, at the same time, that's a separate problem from editing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you you brought it up. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, this is, uh, this is important, though. You you do want to go through and read and, and try and understand, like, what makes what you're reading enjoyable to you, and if it's just your bias or if there's actually something there. And it's it's probably not too hard to distinguish that, but it's also not something that's... It's not easy to explain how to distinguish that. You kind of... It's something you have to consciously work yeah. at. It's something that you'll get better at over time the more you try it. The more, you know, go, go back and take one of your old things that you've written and look at it, like, and pretend... At first, you'll just be pretending, right? You'll just be like, oh, okay, I'm going to try to read this and see what I think about it without a bias. And you'll kind of be, like, pretending that. Eventually, you'll get pretty good at it. You'll be able to say, okay, I'm going to look at this now. I'm going to give it a, my, my critical eye. And I'm gonna poke at as poke as many holes in it as I possibly can. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna nitpick as much of the dialogue as I possibly can, and we'll see where we end up. And you know, uh, again, you don't want to you don't want to polish forever, but once you've gone through a few times with that, and you've added all the stuff you want to add, you'll start to feel like I don't want to add any more to the story, kind of thing. You'll get to a point where you're like, this this is complete. And at that point, it. At that point, does it bring you joy? And if it brings you joy to read it, because you've already read it several times slowly, then it's probably ready for for you to show it to somebody else. And to be honest, even if it doesn't bring you joy, as long as you're confident in the editing of it and you feel like it's print worthy, put it you know put it out there anyway. Because maybe you're not enjoying the thing you wrote, but maybe five hundred other people will. That's true. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily. Doing a good job doesn't necessarily entail loving what you've done. I mean, I've had crappy jobs my whole life, but I've always done good jobs at those jobs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And all those romance novels that you write under a pen name, you don't like them either. Yeah, yeah, that's... <laughs> I, You know, I'm almost tempted to do that just to... Just out of spite. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is all hypothetical, Mrs. Danielle Steele. Yeah. <laughs> 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 all right. I think we've got an episode here. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, we got to the point where you called me Danielle Steele, so I, I think we've. I, I don't, I don't know if we've. We've jumped the shark for sure. I don't know if we've hit peak or if we bottomed out on that note, but here, here we are. Maybe it was both. <laughs> yes, exactly. All right. Well, everybody, thank you for watching. Thanks, thank you for listening. As always, I'm Rudy, and I am probably Justin. Probably, Miss Steele. It, you know, just as a side note, there's this interesting new romance novel that is by Danielle Steele, and I'm not going to say that I'm <laughs> going to root for it. To <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say go out and buy that book, but go out and buy that book. <laughs> Line that woman's pockets with as much money as humanly po Okay. <laughs> My, I mean, that woman's pockets. <laughs> All right. Have a good week, everybody, and uh, we will see you next week with something else. Not sure what. Something. Maybe we should do the Rayman thing. Okay. Okay. I guess we're going to do Rayman next. Hooray, man. <laughs> all right. Catch you all later. Thanks for listening to the Wordy Pair Podcast. Our passion is all things writing, world building, and getting into the weird and wonderful world of fiction. We hope you enjoyed our unique takes. If you did, make sure to like, rate, review, and subscribe to get your weekly dose of writing weirdness. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, hit us up on Twitter. For Rudy, it's at Rudolph underscore Cone. And for Justin, at Ninja Mouse Chew. See you next time on the Wordy Pear Podcast.